so we are very, very excited to have Lee Maryday Porch as our presenter. Um, and I'm, we're going to go ahead and time, turn the time over for her, and she will introduce herself. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, being here today for elopement and Autism Spectrum Disorder, a Parent's Guide to Causes Prevention and What to Do When It Happens. I am Lee Mariday Porch. Um, I am the president of Putnam Project Lighthouse Inc., which is in Putnam County, Florida. We are a nonprofit uh, who we place tracking um, bracelets on individuals who are prone to elopement, such as those with autism, intellectual disability, and dementia. I'm also the author of the Spectrum Alert for Schools, which is a protocol for um, for preparation uh, in the event that, you, that a school has a student who is an eloper on the spectrum. I write the blog Flappiness Is, which is also a website. I am a teacher here in Florida with certifications in ESC, and I have an endorsement in autism spectrum disorders. I speak and advocate, and I also run special needs families of Northeast Florida. More importantly than all of this stuff right here, I am also the parent of a child on the spectrum who elopes. And so that makes this subject um, intensely personal for me. We have experienced this ish issue in my own family. This is Putnam Project Lighthouse. Just wanted to kind of share this was a labor of love and that is my little boy off on the left receiving a tracking bracelet. This was back in 2015 and um, this was um, something that we dedicated to the memory of Avante Akendo who was a young man in New York who um, eloped from his school and tragically um, was found deceased months later. Okay, elopement defined. Um, you'll notice that I put in um, parentheses wandering, and that's because the preferred term um, in the autism community, as well as the dementia and Alzheimer's community, is elopement over wandering. Um, my understanding is that is that autistic self-advocates want to stress that there are reasons why um, individuals with autism do elope. It's not just, you know, wandering around sort of a, sort of a thing. There are actual causes that you can look at. And um, so that, that term is preferred. And of course, that's simply an individual with cognitive challenges or special needs who leaves um, where they're being cared for. Elopement by the numbers. Um, first, let me just say that there aren't a whole lot of numbers on this subject. There is no um, federal office that keeps track of this and is required to do so. The Department of Education does not um, keep track of children who are eloping from school. This is a, a subject that um, we, we don't have a whole lot of information on yet. There's a well-known um, study from Denmark and last year we had the first real numbers um, in 2017 of a study um, that these come from. Um, we know that about half of individuals with autism um, elope. We know that there is uh, a heightened risk of danger for sure. Um, approximately a third of them will be found deceased or gravely injured. Um, and uh, a whopping uh, third of them cannot communicate to first responders or strangers who may encounter them who they are and where they belong. The vast majority of them who die as a result of having eloped, their bodies are found in water, which is why we always use the phrase check water first in the autism community. That's not quite the same thing as with dementia and Alzheimer's. It is unique to autism because our children are often drawn to water. Of those who, um, who die uh, in other ways, they are typically due to traffic um, accidents. They run out in front of a car and that's, that's the second largest um, uh, cause of death as a result of elopement. Two-thirds of families touched by this have had some sort of a close call, um, including a close call with drowning. But unfortunately, less than half of us have had anybody talk to us about what to do 
our physicians don't know much about this subject. Law enforcement, um, unless there has been a major push in that community to have some sort of a program, it's just something that we see often go across on our Facebook feed that there's another child that's missing. Um, the current numbers that have come out is that there is one major um, elopement incident per month, but the National Autism Association has pointed out, and I think rightly so, just based upon the number that I share each month on Facebook, it, it, or that these, these numbers um, are not accurate and that elopement is underreported. The impact on the family and the community is, um, is great. 58% of us who have children on the autism spectrum rank this the most stressful of ASD behaviors. That outranks meltdowns, that outranks eating issues, it outranks even sleep loss, which is kind of hard to believe for those of us who have lived this. Um, and 62% of us feel to some degree isolated because we can't go out into the community. I remember uh, last year being asked to go on a camping trip and you know, kind of laughing, are you kidding? I'm not taking him out in the middle of the, of the forest. No, absolutely not. Um, it is, it, it's, it's a significant issue. Parents will often try to take some sort of measures. You know, they might put one of those little backpacks with the, with the tether on it and attach it to themselves. And they go into Disney World and somebody gives them ugly looks as though they're walking their child like a dog, when in fact, they're just, desperately trying to hold on to a child they fear is in danger of, of running off and um, not coming home again. So it's a lot easier to stay home. And a lot of people report sleep disruptions. They hear a sound, you're terrified that the front door may have opened, so you jump up and then maybe you don't get back to sleep again. And it's, um, it's significant. And even in the community, when uh, we founded Putnam Project Lighthouse, we did some estimates talking to nearby counties who had had to do searches uh, for children and adults on the spectrum. And they estimated that by the time they got their choppers involved and brought in extra personnel and brought in personnel from surrounding counties, that a search for someone on the autism spectrum by law enforcement could cost as much as $10,000 a day or more. Um, so it, it's, it's significantly um, impactful to everyone around the individual prone to elopement. Why do they elope? Well, you know, um, if, if we're talking about a child, sometimes they're just curious and they don't have a sense of danger. My son is nine and a half developmentally. He's somewhere around three and a half to four. He doesn't understand that, that it may be dangerous. So for some, it's just fun. I put this picture of, of my son on a swing because this was our first incident with elopement. He saw a park and saw swing and we weren't expecting it and that's exactly where he where he ran to. Um, some of them, they wanna visit a familiar location. They are very visual thinkers. So you might be driving around town and stop someplace, you know, you wanna run an errand, but they've noted that that's awfully close to Aunt Jean's house and Aunt Jean has a swimming pool and off they go when, you're back, when you know, your back is turned. The desire to pursue a special interest or what some term enthusiasms, um, Many of our children, as you know, are fascinated with things such as trains and train tracks, um, lights, cars, that sort of thing. And if something like that is nearby, they just gravitate toward it. Sensory avoidance is probably the biggest cause. Um, they are overwhelmed by their environment. Avoidance of a stressful situation um, that might be explained by school or church or, or, or something that, that they know is stressful and they want to get away from like everyone else, but maybe they lack the um, communication skills to be able to express that. An unfamiliar caregiver can often be um, associated with elopement, 45% of elopement cases that have reached the news and have been recorded in last year's study. The person who was caring for the child or the adult with autism at the time was not a parent or guardian. An unfamiliar location 
or holidays. Anything that is unfamiliar is, is going to heighten the risk of elopement. Holidays, um, summer vacations, backyard pool parties, that sort of thing, all of those sorts of things can place added stress on, um, on our children. And, you know, they because it's unfamiliar and because they often lack the ability to mark time, that can create a sense of panic and a, and a a desire to get away, as well as darker causes such as bullying or abuse, which they may not be able to communicate. And that, of course, is every parent's nightmare, the thought that something is happening that their child would desperately want to get away from, and, um, and they can't communicate that. Sensory processing disorder is going to be the one that is, um, I think, most to blame. And it's also the one that perhaps that we have some ability to control. It is defined as a condition in which the brain has difficulty receiving and responding to sensory information. Um, it can cause uh, those with autism to become oversensitive to their environment. And I don't mean just oversensitive like you're in Chili's and you hear, you know, the, the clash of dishes in the background. To someone with autism, that can be like gunshots going off. It is, um, it's more than just annoying like we would experience it. It can be physically painful. Um, tags on clothing, that sort of thing can be physically painful and they may be attempting to get away from that. We have to pay attention to any issues with SPD because that is often a root cause. Common sensory triggers, crowds, um, loud noises, bright lights, transitions, physical discomfort, and smells. And I put a picture off to the side here because a lot of people note that sensory processing disorder is not included in the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual for Physicians. It is not a recognized disorder um, at this time. It's not considered a medical condition. However, there have been some recent brain studies and they've actually found this um, lit up on scans and it is a real thing and I think it's not going to be too long before that is um, included in the DSM but as of right now it is not um, but rest assured it is a real thing and it is not a figment of their imagination or ours. Most of what we can do is going to involve prevention because once it actually happens there's only so much that you can do um, and that you can activate that you have already put in place. Some of this is going to be environmental. Teacher training is going to be a big one. If they're in a chaotic classroom environment, um, that's going to explain why, um, why they want to get away. I want to get away in a chaotic classroom environment. I spent 20 years um, teaching in middle school and there were any number of times I wanted to get away and I'm not autistic. So imagine if all of your senses are being inundated and overwhelmed by um, all of the input of scraping chairs and somebody screaming and especially if your child is in a is in a self-contained environment with other children who may have emotional disorders or autism, that can be a pretty loud and um, and chaotic place um, more so than even, you know, the regular education classroom. Safety, locks, alarms, adequate supervision, and we're going to look at some of the um, things that you can purchase for that. Behavioral approaches can be extremely effective. We have used that in, um, in conjunction with my son's um, elopement tendencies as well as electronic monitoring. General tips to ward off elopement. First one here is get to know your neighbors, and I mean really get to know them. Pro let them get to know your child. Let your child be a real person to them. Get out, walk around the neighborhood, say hello, knock on some doors. Pass out an information flyer with a couple of different pictures of, of your child. Invite them to a cookout. You know, have them over for coffee, explain what they might see and, and what they should do and include all of your numbers and, and how to text you and how to call and how to do 
all of that. Let them know who, who he or she is and have an emotional investment in um, wanting to make sure that he or she gets home again um, and doesn't just turn away. One of the saddest things that I have ever heard was a case here in Florida in Jacksonville a couple of years ago. There was a three or four year old child who eloped and um, a passerby stopped and called it in and then left. Didn't have any sort of emotional attachment to that situation. The child wandered off a little bit further and police arrived within two or three minutes and that child had already gone over some kind of a into a culvert and you know out into a um a waterway here in florida and drowned and just i guess what i'm saying is anything that you can do to connect the people around who might see them out and about around your home i would absolutely make that investment I would get to know the people in your neighborhood, so to speak. Secure your home, door and windows alarms, fencing, pool fencing and pool covers. Our children can be drawn to water like moths to a flame. It is said that, you know, water can be the Pied Piper for those with autism. It, you know, it, and if you think about how enjoyable it is for us, um, you know, we all we all think of, about getting into a hot tub or a pool as being incredibly relaxing and enjoyable. Well, now imagine that you have all of these sensory issues. Well, of course, they're drawn to it and um, making certain that they cannot get into water if they cannot swim is important. And even if they can swim, that's not a guarantee that some sort of an accident won't occur. A designated attendant or a family meeting. This is something that. I learned to do after a couple of frightening incidents. Um, we had a birthday party for my daughter and I, when we have that sort of an event, a cookout, something like that, I hire a sitter who is familiar with my son and that person's only job is to stay with him because your head is going to get turned. It just is. People are going to draw your attention. The the coals on the fire are going to start to, um, you know, the fire is going to go down. What, whatever is happening, you're going to be distracted and you need to have one person who is um, assigned to, um, to make sure that um, the individual with autism is not unsupervised. And I would absolutely hold a family or a family and friends meeting if you have a get together at your house or you go to someone else's house where everybody stops what they're doing and you have a, a, a real moment for five minutes where you say, okay, look, look who's here and here are the situations and we need everyone behind them to lock doors and, and to do this and to be aware and we're asking you to, to join our team here to help protect our loved one. Um, that can be a huge help and make certain that the children hear it. Um, we had a, a frightening incident in my family where we were at a cookout at, uh, my brother-in-law's house, and we had the family meeting. We talked to everyone about it. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we don't know who did it. We'll never know, but somebody left a door unlocked, and at that time, we didn't have a designated attendant, and my son got out the front door, and I remember running outside and looking and seeing the St. John's River across the street. It's a moment I will never forget, and it is the moment that probably led to the founding of Putnam Project Lighthouse for me, just absolutely terrifying. But um, remember, any situation that is unusual, you want to have every safeguard. A predetermined safe space, and I think this is extremely important, especially in schools. If your child is prone to becoming stressed in a cafeteria, and that's a stressful place. I've done enough cafeteria duty as a middle school teacher over the years. Um, I can attest that it would be enormously stressful for my son to be in the same in the same place. There needs to be a place where they can go. If if they don't want to go to the basketball game because the kids are all kicking, you know, pounding their feet on the bleachers, then um, then they need to have a way to go and to escape and feel safe. Medic alert bracelets can be useful, but everybody on the street is not necessarily going to stop and look at that. Um, the person who looks at that is likely to be a first responder, and at that point, something has probably happened. I wouldn't have that be my only um, 
my only um, tip to, you know, to avoid elopement. Um, large special needs strollers can be useful, even if you have a child that does not have an issue with, um, with walking in any way. We have one that looks just like the one that you see on the screen here. Um, we use it in situations where we go into, say, a shopping mall, um, something that can be a little bit overwhelming in that way. And we have found that it's, it's relaxing for him. He feels a little cocooned and secure and is happy and flopping and feeling joyful. And we'll use it in a situation like a, like a festival, that sort of thing. Um, we don't use it that often, but we'll use it in those situations. And um, it certainly has um, prevented um, him from, from getting far before. Behavioral approaches to, um, to preventing elopement. If you have a serious issue, if you have a child who is, is doing this frequently and this is taking over your life, I would absolutely seek out the assistance of a board certified behavior analyst at a behavior therapy clinic. I mean, some school districts have them on staff but be forewarned, just because somebody is called the behavior analyst in a school does not necessarily mean that they have had years of training in this. They may simply be a special ed teacher who took a couple of classes during the summer and got a new designation by their school district. Um, that is certainly the case here in Florida. So I would advise you to know who it is who is um, doing a functional um, behavior assessment on your child because quite frankly they might not be that good at it or that experienced with it but I would absolutely seek out um, some behavior analysis to find the the cause for it stating your expectations if you have a child who is um, who has language um, stating expectations uh, might be useful maintaining access to their augmentative forms of communication if they are language limited um, you know, just because sometimes I think parents have a tendency to say, oh, I know what he wants. You know, we, we sort of intuit if they're hungry and, and that sort of thing. And, and maybe parents will leave their augmentative communication um, books and iPads and that sort of thing at home. We'll forget to take them with us. Well, you're stealing their words and you might just be stealing the words that they use to say I am overwhelmed. So make sure you have those and make sure that you have um, pictures that they have been taught and understand. Stop and start. This is one that um, the behavior analyst um, did with my son and has his one-to-one -one aid practice with him daily. And this was mainly so that if we yell stop, he has an immediate reaction and will stop. Doesn't mean he's not ever going to take off on us. But and, and she just does that walking around, you know. I mean, we we do it in the grocery store. We're just walking around and say, stop. And he does, and good job, and you know, a little reward. I mean, he is significantly um uh language delayed and um you know, the word stop is important for us. And there have been times where we have been out and about and he has bolted quickly. And uh, we had an incident in Target just this past summer where he took off for the front doors. He could have easily, if he had not been trained to stop on a dime that way by practicing it daily, um, he could have easily run right out the front doors and crossed in front of a vehicle. Do not reinforce elopement for attention gain. We have a tendency sometimes when children run off and giggle to, to giggle as well. And sometimes elopement is for attention. And if you have a child who is doing that, you want to make certain that they are not benefiting in any way from the elopement. You need to keep a neutral expression. There should not be any smiling. Don't, don't give eye contact and a whole lot of, um, of reinforcement for for running off, you want to make sure that that's not where they um, where they get the positive um, attention. Instead, you want to give them positive reinforcement for proximity. Good job staying here, and I don't care if you use candy. Some people say candy is overused, but I will tell you, there are things that are a heck of a lot more dangerous than candy for your child, and that's getting run over by a car. 
um, I, I tend to lose patience with, um, with people who say, oh, you know, behavior analysis, that's just nothing but giving them rewards, will, you'll never teach them. You know what, if giving those rewards um, gives my child the ability to understand and to be taught not to run off, I'm going to use those rewards. Make sure that you also teach them how to request your attention, whether that's tapping you on the shoulder or, um, or using a sign or pointing to their communication book. Um, you want to make sure that they have the ability to express what it is they need or want. Um, Patty, I was supposed to pause periodically and give any sort of opportunity for any questions. Are there any? Um, Lee, so far there are no questions, um, but thank you for stopping. And everybody also remember that you can ask questions. Just type them into the question box or the chat box, and um, we'll be sure to give them to Lee um, when, when we get them. Thanks. Okay, some home safety measures for elopement. You can find these just about anywhere. Um, I have included um, in the um, handout that Patty will be sending you later um, some links to various places where you can get these, but honestly, you can find them at Home Depot and Lowe's and Amazon.com. Um, really, it's just a matter of having the correct search term to put in there. Battery-operated window and door alarms. A hanging door alarm can be very useful on the child's bedroom as well as when you're traveling, going to hotels, that sort of thing. Um, digital door locks, as long as they're working on both sides, there are some locks that automatically will close. Double bolt locks, the kind where you have to use a key on the inside. I know that many would argue that, okay, well, what if somebody needs to get out during a fire? I don't have an answer for that. I think that you have to weigh what is the greatest danger for your child. Is the greatest danger a fire or is the greatest danger running out of your house if you happen to live right off of a busy street and getting, you know, uh, killed by a vehicle? This is an issue that there are no um, perfect answers to. There just aren't. There are even, you know, bed tents that you can set up where you can slide the entire mattress into um, the bed tent. They tend to be pretty pricey. Um, and we used that when my son was a toddler because he would he would get out and try to get away. But there are people who have pretty strong feelings about that and say, well, how is that much different than a cage? When he was little, I viewed that more as not being much different than being in a crib. But if you have a 20-year-old um, locked up in a tent, yeah, that, that may seem like a cage. And that's not going to be pretty. At the same time, if that adult child has Houdini-like tendencies and gravitates to water or to traffic or to railroad tracks, um, I, I think that you have to weigh that. And all of our solutions um, that we have available to us are not necessarily perfect. A video monitoring system can also be useful, especially if you have a larger house or you have an upstairs, um, that sort of thing. But all of these are available and um, including even like the hotel locks that go at the top of the doors if your ch child is not you know, reach their full height, um, that sort of thing. But all of these can be useful inside the home. The problem is, is that a lot of elopement occurs outside the home. So um, moving on here to the subject of tracking technology. There are a lot, a lot of options out there available to us. Some are better than others. Um, on this, um, I have a list of some that are, you know, you'll see them come across on the internet when you look up this sort of thing. I have not personally used any of these. Maybe I would use some of these if my son were, if his abilities were such that he were more verbal or there were things that could be explained to him, but his disability is pretty significant. So I personally do not consider these to be very viable. Um, tracking technologies. 
when you have someone who is on the more severe end of the spectrum. You also have GPS enabled tracking. Um, and that sounds fabulous, except that it is vulnerable to weather and other obstructions. If you like we we do not prefer to put GPS enabled tracking in um, on our clients in Putnam Project Lighthouse, um, we, we have dementia patients as well. We don't like to put GPS enabled tracking on them once they reach a certain level of severity because the elderly tend to gravitate toward the woods and other areas that are covered. They're often found in bushes and um, that sort of thing. And children tend to crawl into cars or metal structures such as a, a shed and that sort of thing, and those absolutely can be impacted. If your cell phone coverage can be impacted, then the GPS tracker that you have on your child can be as well. And I wanna point out the obvious, the technology only works if it remains on the individual. Um, if you have a child like mine, he may not think anything at all of stripping if it gets hot. You know, he might just kick his shoes right off. And if you have a GPS tracker on the shoe, well, that's not going to do you a whole lot of good. So myself, for the severity of intellectual disability and autism that my son has, I want something that isn't going to come off and I know will work. And for me, that's radio frequency. Um, and I'm going to I'll show you um, information about the organization that provides that. But um, I, it's just really going to depend upon your child and your needs. GPS is nice. You can see where they are, just like find my phone on your iPhone or, or that sort of thing. But um, if you have a child that they should never be off um, by themselves due to their severity, I don't know that, that having a GPS tracker where you can see the screen is necessarily your greatest um, advantage. So again, it, it just really depends upon your child. Okay, so AngelSense is one of the two most well-known of the tracking technologies. It is GPS technology and it's a pretty involved system. There are pros to it. It is in the parent's control. You do not have to wait on the sheriff's department to arrive with a receiver um, like you do with um, radio frequency tracking. You can listen in to what is going on. Now I wanna go ahead and state that that can be an issue in some states in which um, you are not allowed to listen into your child's class. Um, some schools have an issue with children wearing angel scents because you could theoretically listen into your child's class. Um, it, it can be glitchy. Um, many people report um, user error and that sort of thing. Supposedly it has um, great customer service. There's a very cool interactive map where you can see exactly where they are. Um, and, um, and you know, you've got the, the control yourself as a parent. My concerns are, um, my understanding is that it's $45 a month for the, um, for the tracking um, coverage, you know, the, um, the fees associated monthly. It is vulnerable to interference like we talked about before. It has a notoriously short battery life. It will tell you that it needs to replace the batteries, but if you have a busy life, um, you know, that, that could become an issue. It is not waterproof. If you go to their site, there are instructions for what to do if it becomes submerged in water that sound exactly like what to do if your cell phone becomes submerged in water. And that is, um, I, I think that's problematic when you're talking about a population that can be drawn to watery. And there are boundary errors. Um, AngelSense maps out boundaries and sometimes it can alert you that the child has um, gone past the boundary um, when the child has not. So, you know, there are some, there are some issues with it, but, um, but it is a popular um, tracking technology. Okay. The next one that um, that I want to talk about, this is Project Lifesaver International. 
I am not paid to endorse Project Lifesaver International. I will, for the sake of honesty, say that this is the one that we use in my nonprofit. It is the oldest, it is the best known, and it is the one that uses radio frequency technology. Um, the way it works in our county is we have three receivers in three um, uh, close cities in the county. If a child goes missing, the closest one is uh, activated immediately and the other two are coming to triangulate a search. And my understanding is that that's how most counties prefer to do that. Um, it is waterproof to eight to 10 feet of water. You can still locate that child. Um, and that means a child can go swimming in it and can bathe in it, and there are no dangers to them damaging it um, by, you know, jumping in a jumping in a pool. Um, there, they do have a variety of tracking options as well to meet individual needs. Um, examples would be like with um, with dementia populations. Um, you know, some of those folks are still out driving and GPS might make sense if you can still get in a car and drive to another state but might forget why you drove there or who you are. Um, you know, there are certain situations in which GPS might be ideal, especially if you have someone with autism who might walk home from school. You know, you may really want that GPS. I do know some families that have both. Project Lifesaver often tends to be provided by some sheriff's departments um, and law enforcement, so it's free for families. But I know some families who also have angel sense for peace of mind and have both. Um, and I can see why that would make sense for some families. Project Lifesaver International to date, knock on wood, has not lost a single client who has been registered in the program, and they have found almost 3,500 clients so far have been returned safely home. This is the one that was associated most closely with the Justice Department grant that Senator Chuck Schumer, Avante's Law and all that sort of thing, um, um, you know, the, the, this is the um, service that most of those have used is Project Lifesaver International. Okay, and I would say that the most expensive option, but one that I sure wish I had, was um, is an autism service dog. This is not a small undertaking for families. People, I think, sometimes think that just means you just get a dog and the dog's trained and it's really that simple and it is not. This is a huge time investment. The time that it might take for a family to get a dog from the time that they apply and make the financial um, commitment can be a year. They have to find just the right dog. Um, they have to train the dog for the individual needs of the child and that depends on what those needs are. If you need a dog who can um, alert for a seizure, well, that's a whole different skill that has to be um, taught. But there are some autism service dogs who are trained to stay with and be tethered to um, their individual with autism. Um, they will simply um, attempt to redirect that person back to safety. Um, in some events, they will just drop and refuse to move. Um, and allow them to, you know, it, rather than allow them to dart in front of traffic. This can be extremely expensive. When you apply to one of these um, autism service dog um, nonprofits and organizations, typically the dogs can cost anywhere from ten to twenty thousand dollars. The family commitment is usually half of that which means that usually what you have to do is hold some sort of fundraisers and barbecues and raffles and, and you've got to get the community involved if you don't happen to have a spare $10,000 lying around. Um, you, there's a lot of training involved. A lot of these um, organizations will want the entire family to hop on a plane or to drive out and come and spend a week or two to be trained in how to um, in how to care for and um, use the dog to the best of their training. Um, but it can certainly be effective. The con certainly would also be that the dog has a limited lifespan and you're looking at turning around and doing this all over again in 
10 to 15 years or, or whatever the dog's lifespan is. But an autism service dog certainly could be a very effective thing to um, eliminate the danger of elopement. Um, Patty, I will stop again just to make sure there aren't any questions. Okay, thank you. Yes, we do have a question. It's a little bit long, so I will read it. Um, um, Mary says, my granddaughter has eloped um, from her new classroom multiple times, and they were not informed by the school. It is in her IEP. They don't consider it elopement because she did not attempt to leave the building. She just like left the classroom and went into the hallway. She said she has requested alarms on the outside door by her classroom, and they have not responded. She asks, do you have any suggestions? She is with new untrained aides in her classroom, and they just don't seem to understand. Um, some history, Ava is eight. She was found in a retention pond near drowning when she was three and a half. Um, so, okay. Wow, bless your heart. That is absolutely terrifying. And that, that situation doesn't surprise me. I hear this a lot from families. Um, I had to educate my own school district. Um, the fact that they don't have a def that they don't even understand the definition of elopement. She ran off from where she was supposed to be. Um, that that's elopement right there. Um, it is not safe for her to be alone anywhere on school grounds. So they don't even have the correct definition of elopement. Um, that that would be concerning to me. If I I mean, if you're going to ask what I, I personally would do, I would schedule a director with the, I would schedule a meeting with the director of special ed. And I would absolutely lay out some of this um, information. I would provide them with a definition of elopement. I would look up the story of Avante Akendo in New York, spelled A-V-O-N-T-E-O-Q-U-E-N-D-O. Um, and I would, sometimes you, sometimes you have to be the squeaky wheel. And I would sit down and I would talk about how it would, um, you know, not be in anyone's best interest to have that child get away. Um, I would um, request autism training. Um, I don't know if you in Ohio have card centers or not centers for autism and related disabilities, or, or some cards are called Centers for Autism and Related Disorders. Um, I, you certainly have a parent information center that um, can, can assist you with how to advocate for this. Um, and, and you did good by having this in the IEP, but I just simply would not let this issue go. I would, I would flat out say I want this training, and I would put that in writing because I will promise you as, you know, I spent a lot longer as a teacher than I did as an autism parent. And the minute you put what you want in writing and you send that to an ESC director, I'll tell you, you're going to get a whole lot more um, attention and respect for that. They don't want there to be a trail in writing of you having asked for something and then that child walking off of school grounds. They, they don't want that. But um, but I would push. I, elopement is not always going to be justification for a one-to-one -one aid, but it certainly is justification to have somebody come in and do some training with the school. And there's always somebody available to do that for free. I mean, there just is. They're going to have their own specialists in the district. Um, and I I'd schedule an appointment. I would absolutely, I would have a list on paper of what you want and, um, and, and follow up on that. And perhaps, um, Patty, your um, center might be able to provide her with some additional um, pointers for how to go about doing that in preparation for, um, for scheduling a new IEP to address it. Yes. Oh, sorry. Lee didn't mean to interrupt you. Yes, that, that's definitely something that I was going to bring up at the end, that anybody who's having issues like this, 
um, with their IEPs or, or um, anything to do with school, you can call us and we'll give you the phone number. Um, if you live within our 94 counties, you can call us at Family Matters. But if you don't, we can give you the number to the to the parent training and information that works with you. So please don't hesitate to call and you can talk more directly with us. We can help you write letters. We can help you with the IEP meetings and that kind of stuff. So just give us a call. Okay, so um, engaging with law enforcement. This was something that we built into our program here in Florida um, when we set this up. And Florida has recently required autism training, autism awareness training for law enforcement. So all of our law enforcement now has had it. But four years ago when we began this, they had not. And um, I just was a squeaky wheel and um, reached out to, found out the name of the gentleman who um, who supervised the school resource officers. I don't know if that's um, extremely common in Ohio or not um, to have school resource officers at most schools, but it, it is extremely common in Florida. And um, we arranged for um, training for those officers and I lobbied the school district pretty hard as well for administrators to have it um, too. But um, we asked for them to start coming in and spending more time in our special education classes because one of the things that we noted is that a lot of um, a lot of our our students had a fear. You know, they'll they'll watch a TV show where they see a bad cop or they see you know even a bad guy getting in trouble with the police, but they see a shooting situation and they're convinced that law enforcement only wants to hurt them. And I, I think it's extremely important for them to encounter first responders in a positive way long before they are in an emergency situation. So call your local fire station, ask if you can bring them down and let them look at the truck. Please give them a heads off, a heads up not to set off the um, the horn on the fire truck that might not go well for some of our kids, but um, any sort of experiences like that that can be positive and, you know, have some treats involved and involve smiles and hellos and warm moments, I think can teach our children to look for those individuals when they are lost or when they are scared. Um, as well as um, go ahead and um, if I were you, if I had a child prone to this, um, I would provide a background sheet and writing for law enforcement, let them know, take it to the sheriff's department, take it to the police department, um, and let them know who this child is with pictures. Um, make certain that that goes to um, the dispatch, the folks in dispatch, so that they know if they don't have um, if they don't already have some kind of an autism tracking program. And if they do, they're already going to have some of these things set up. But if they don't, I'd simply provide it. I know that Autism Speaks can be, um, um, some people uh, do not prefer to access Autism Speaks, some do. I will say that there is a useful form on their site that, um, that you can use to um, fill out and um, take to, to law enforcement. And there are lots of stickers and that sort of thing that you can have on the windows to your home and the windows to your car in the event that you're in an accident, like the one shown here. I, I, we have them on, on our cars and our family. Autistic elopement and schools. I, I kind of talked a little bit about this um, already um, as a result of the, the question. But one of the things that I would certainly stress in a meeting is that it's more likely to occur during special events with the school um, and making certain that there is a place that is an alternative to whatever is happening that may be incredibly stressful for your child. Many schools do not know how to respond. Um, the tragedy that occurred with Avante Akendo in New York is that by the time the school realized he was gone, they didn't immediately contact his mother. They first ran around looking for him, only they didn't know exactly where to look first. They didn't know check water first. They didn't know, you know, check trains. Um, they didn't have that information. They, they just desperately went around looking, um, which is I'm sure a natural reaction, but it was, it was the wrong. Um, reaction to have. The first thing they should have done was call law enforcement and the parent. 
um, and they did not do that. I think it was some two hours before the parent was notified. And um, sadly, his mother had to live with him missing for five months before his remains um, washed up in in the Hudson. Um, it, um, it it was a it, it was something that brought the issue of autistic elopement to um, the attention of schools throughout the country, but I don't think enough. And it was what prompted me to um, create the Spectrum Alert, which I'll show you in just a moment. Okay, the Spectrum Alert for schools. Um, I don't have the whole article here. You can access it if you look up Spectrum Alert, Huffington Post, Spectrum Alert, and my name. It is on the Huffington Post, and I, I have offered it to free to any school or district in the, in the country who wants to use this. There are some um, school districts that have adopted this for all of their schools. They've actually written this in as um, as an alert, just like a fire alarm or a um, or an armed intruder alert or a hurricane drill or any of that sort of thing, that's how it is done here in my county. Um, it is a series of steps that a school can take. Most of them are preventative. Some of them. Um, address communication and it tells it, it will tell the school exactly what to do but the important part is for them to be ready with photographs and with law enforcement as well as somebody at the school who knows that child um, you don't I mean you can say always check water but if there's no body of water you don't want to stop right there if you have little Johnny and little Johnny has an aunt who um, lives down the road who has a set of train tracks in her backyard. Well, I think we can predict where little Johnny is going to go. But maybe little Susie, who is drawn to water, um, is, is going to know that there is a retention pond nearby. Part of the, this um, protocol is making certain that the school knows what autistic children they have in their school, what their interests and their inclinations are. Um, it is a, a series of eight steps, and um, I'm happy to have you share it with your school and have them use it and call it that, and um, I, I offer it for free. So um, please do look that up if you're having an issue um, with your child's school. The most important suggestion that I would make for you if you have a child who is prone to elopement, who cannot swim, is that you seek out specialized swimming instruction. This is going to be a very, very, very big deal. Um, they, they simply may not learn in the same way that they would if they were in a large group of, um, of swimmers um, learning. There are ways to do this effectively. We have several organizations like this in Florida that offer this sort of thing, and they do it in conjunction with behavior analysts who come in and help map out and design a program for it. Some YMCAs offer it. On the resources sheet that Patty will be sending to you, there is a link that you can go to online and you can look by state for which, um, uh, you know, which programs are offered in which state. Um, Patty also looked up in your area, chicagobluedolphins.com and Sensationals Swim School. Dot com offer special needs swimming lessons as well. And this would be first on my list of, um, of preventative measures because if they get to water, um, you're going to want to make certain that they can get out of the water safely. Unfortunately, you know, a tracking bracelet, it works, it's great, but it's probably going to take four minutes and it only takes four minutes to drown. So you, wanna, you want them to be able to help themselves. Some final thoughts. I've talked about everything really except what to do if they do go um, missing. The first one is I would say that you need to pick up the phone and call 911 immediately. Somebody needs to go to water immediately. Um, that is one of the um, steps in the spectrum alert is that there is one person whose job is to go and do that first. If that child is drawn to um, traffic lights, to trains, to um, 
you know, to subway stations, that's the first place that you go. Um, the what you do is largely dependent upon what you have already put in place, but you do not spend time looking first. You do not go around the park looking everywhere. You call 911 immediately, even if you think they might just be around the corner. Um, there is no time to waste with that. My other final thoughts are you have to be vigilant. You may think that you have trained this out of them. We believed that with my son. We thought we'd done all of this stuff with the behavior analyst. And last month, Patty, um, we, you know, we know each other um, via Facebook and through some various autism groups. She will remember last month when I was stunned after four years that I got a call from my son's school. He has an autism tracking bracelet through Project Lifesaver. He has a one-to-one -one aide who has been trained in autism, who loves and adores him. He got away. He got off the of school grounds and crossed a street. He has no understanding of traffic whatsoever. He crossed the street and was found standing there flapping and spinning a ball in the air. Just because you have trained and taught them not to do it doesn't mean that they won't suddenly one day do it again. If you have one who has been an eloper once, you should always consider them capable of elopement. Um, to plan ahead, enlist those around you. Um, create a phone chain. You know, talk, talk to family and friends, talk to neighbors, create a phone chain. If that child should go missing, yeah, you're going to call 911, but start a phone chain of people who will walk out of the door in their pajamas and their boots in the middle of the winter and start looking as well. Don't wait. Have a plan in place. As far as the stress of having an eloper, you need to get away from time to time. This is incredibly, incredibly stressful. It will affect every part of your ability to concentrate and to be vigilant. And you need to make certain that if you don't have respite built into your life via insurance or state resources that you enlist family and friends who can offer this to you in some way because it is incredibly stressful. When you see these articles, and these posts and shares that go across on the internet about children who have gone missing, um, those who have been hurt and been, been deceased who have been autistic, I'm going to tell you now, don't read the comments because it's going to be people who don't understand, who say horrible things, like where were the parents? Our children can be clever and resourceful. They may not be verbal, but they may get away anyway, despite all of your best efforts, every effort that you have. I created a nonprofit in my community to address this and my child, he still got away. It happens. So, um, you know, just remember that there are people out there who don't understand and don't take it to heart. Don't convince yourself you're a terrible parent because your child got away from you for a minute. And remember to forgive yourself and others. This can rip apart a marriage. If you have dad having been in charge while you were cooking outside and, and your autistic child got away and was found in the neighbor's yard, it can be very easy to tear into each other, to tear into grandma and grandpa. But the truth is there's nothing about this that is a perfect solution. And sometimes it's going to happen and you've got to forgive yourself. You're not a horrible parent because of it. And you've got to forgive your loved ones because maybe they just aren't as well trained in having that hypervigilance that that we have. Um, and that is basically all I have for you. This is a contact page for how to get in touch with me. Are there any other questions that I might be able to answer for you? Um, yes, Lee, there's one. I think you sort of answered it already, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, so Nicole asked, she says her little boy is three years old. He has not eloped, but they're very concerned that he could because he does not like to walk and does not stop when told to. Should She's asking, should we reach out to law enforcement before he elopes instead of after something tragic happens? So I guess he hasn't yet, but she's concerned that he may someday elope and so should she talk to her law enforcement now rather than waiting until he does start eloping? I would absolutely do that. Um, you may find that your local law enforcement already has a program out there. 
um, the the tracking bracelets that we put on um, individuals with autism in this county you know sometimes it can take a little bit of an adjustment we typically will take like a broken Fitbit or a hospital bracelet and put them on them for like five minutes at a time or so but eventually it just comes becomes something that stays on them and if um, if that's an issue with your little guy, I, I would definitely reach out to them, definitely want to have an information sheet going to them, but I'd also inquire to see what they have in place. And please know that even if your local law enforcement does not have an autism elopement safety program in place, if you go to, I mean, Obviously, there, there are some of the other options like AngelSense and that sort of thing that are parent controlled, but Project Lifesaver does have programs as well for families who live in areas where there is not an active program going on. And then there is always the chance of reaching the right person and starting something. I did. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to start a nonprofit. I just couldn't stand it and decided there needed to be something in place and eventually got a hold of the right person. and. Before we knew it, there it was. There is a fantastic Justice Department grant that any um, law enforcement agency can apply for to get this equipment provided to them for free. And um, and I, I would encourage you absolutely to reach out and find out what's available now. Let them get to know your little guy as well as see what you can do in your community to um, make it safer for for kids like ours. Thank you, Lee. And along with that, um, in Illinois, um, we have the autism program, which um, does have trainings for first responders. Uh, so that includes like um, ambulance drivers, paramedics, police officers, and firefighters. And, um, you know, a lot of it is understanding autism and knowing how to um, maybe approach a child with autism, that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know for sure. I, I think they do offer a part, a piece of their training does talk a little bit about wandering. Um, they have lost some funding, so I'm not sure how extensive uh, throughout the state they are. But um, you can call us and we can give you information about the different uh, locations throughout the state too. And it might be something that they may be able to come to your town or whatever and do a training. So just wanted to throw that out there too. Yeah, so, all right. Well, I wanna thank you, Lee, so much for this because um, I know this is a topic of great importance. I actually have a friend who lost their child um, to elopement a good 10 or well probably 15 years ago so um, I know you know how tragic this can be so I really appreciate you um, providing such great information to us so we're going to go ahead and